the next speaker, which is uh, Joachim uh, Seiler from Gunnebo House. And uh, this, he's, we sort of get brought over to towards um, applied research or practical research, I would say, uh, in, in your presentation. You have uh, you've done a lot of um, research through the means of actually, you know, testing uh, historic methods. So that's, uh, I'm sure, going to be one part of what you're going to speak about. But Joachim is the head uh, head gardener of uh, Gunnebo House, uh, and uh, Gunnebo House is the host of, of this uh, whole webinar, you could say. So um, looking forward to hearing more about uh, your work on uh, pathways in historic gardens, Joachim. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen here, screen here. So just a second. Um, does it look okay but we think I yeah think it looks like it should looks like it should very good i'll just um so um i will uh, make a presentation about sustainable and historical manage uh, maintenance of pathways in, in historical gardens and it says in the program that it's uh, Joachim Seiler and Daniel Lundberg. And Daniel Lundberg is my colleague. And uh, um, he wanted me to make the presentation. But uh, what I will bring forth here is uh, our uh, collective study that we have done. And I will talk uh, more about that later on. So so you, you won't see Daniel, but I will uh, tell um, uh, communicate his his. Uh, uh, experience as well in this presentation. So, and Daniel is also in in the webinar, so he can answer questions. Uh, absolutely, in, in yeah. case there are questions toward him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, as Jenny said, my name is Joachim Seiler, and I'm head gardener at Gunnebo House, and um, I've made a thesis about historical gardening craft at the Department of Conservation at the University of Gothenburg. And the original intention was to write about management regimes for lawns, hedges, and pathways in historic gardens. Um, at the end, pathways were excluded from the thesis project. But I, I studied the topic for quite some time and will share some of my uh, study with you today. The material about pathways have not been comprehensively published, um, only in a small Swedish publication at the Craft Laboratory and the Swedish National Heritage Board. And it's uh, this publication, uh, um, Maintenance of Historic Gardens Pathways. It's written in Swedish and it's available as a PDF on the uh, National Heritage Board uh, website and also at the Craft Laboratory at the um, Gothenburg University. So that's the only publication that we have made so far uh, regarding pathways. Um, in this presentation I would say something about historic gardening craft concerning pathways but uh, also about tools and materials and uh, and also discuss norms authenticity, weed control, and the future, or the, the current challenges that we have with uh, uh, our historic gardens and pathways. And well, I studied the topic pathways in my PhD, as I said, uh, and my colleague, uh, the gardener, Daniel Lundberg, got a craft scholarship from the craft laboratory in 2016 to study the topic. And we have collaborated a lot in our historical and practical craft studies. And the, the research question regarding pathways was, uh, how did they manage pathways in the 18th century? So that was our... Uh, uh, our research question for the study. And uh, one type of material that we have studied is, of course, written sources for from several countries, because as the 
And Andreasson also said that the, the Swedish source material, the written sources and image sources from Sweden, they are so few. It's uh, so so we don't have a lot of source material. So we have to to find written sources about pathway management. We have to turn uh, all over Europe, I would say, or or especially to to France and and uh, uh, and the UK. The book, The Theory and Practice of Gardening by Desalier, was very influential in large parts of Europe in the 18th century. So uh, it was found in the, the library at Gunnebo, for instance, and in uh, everyone uh, read that book and, and used it a lot, and it was translated to many lang languages. So it was originally written in, fr in French, but that, that was a very influential um, garden manual. Um, and Desalier says that walks make one of the principal duties of gardens. Among the several sorts of walks, I shall take notice of the close and the open, the single and the double, the white and the green. And I think it, it was a good way of starting to just think of pathways that they are not, it's just not one thing. It, it can be many different things. Uh, so we have... Uh, uh, close walks uh, with uh, uh, trellises or uh, covered by trees, and we have the open walks at the parterre in the Fleshy Gardens, and we have single walks and double walks, and we have white walks, which is uh, the uh, sand or gravel walks, and we have the green walks, uh, which is very unusual today, uh, at least in, in the Nordic countries. Uh, which is uh, the, the the lawn as a walk, a pathway. Um, so in Sweden, um, you really have to use the magnifying glass to find sources. Uh, in Sweden, we have the book Svesia uh, Antika et Hodjelna, and it was published in the early 18th century to show how glorious the castles and gardens of Sweden were. It was the publication meant to promote Sweden as a powerful country abroad. And if you study this book as a gardener closely, you can not only see um, uh, gardens, but also gardeners performing their works in, in some of the uh, illustrations. Uh, and here we see some examples of this. We see some images from the Svesia showing the work with Dutch hoes, which is uh, schiffeljärn, rakes, uh, weeding, and wheelbarrows. Um, so we find some prep, uh, some uh, of the management work and also some of the tools in the, the Svesia. One early source was the French royal gardener, André Mollet, who was working for the Swedish queen, Christina, and he described the construction of pathways in the Swedish edition of his book, The Pleasure Garden, in 1651. Mollet wrote that the pathways should be constructed out of a mixture of stones and glue or clay in a good shoe thickness and covered with sand. The pathway should be solid so that no grass could grow in it, both for the construction and for the management of pathways. Mollet recommends the use of a hard stone roller. Um, and the study of historical sources from several countries led to a general ab idea about pathway management in our study. Um, and uh, so... Some of the tools that we found was uh, uh, here. I only have the Swedish and the, uh, the English names for the the tools. So uh, we find they used a lot of rollers, which is the velt in Swedish. Uh, brooms were used to manage the pathways. Uh, crust, usually uh, birch brooms. Dutch hose. Uh, were popular then and are still in some gardens at least. 
Kfifelian, um, and Rakes, uh, Chartour. And then uh, a tool that we are not so used to anymore that we will look a bit closer on uh, soon, Rabot, this uh, smoothing loot, Raka. Um, which is used in constru road constructions today, not, not really in maintenance of pathways in historic gardens. And the wheel hoe that we see in this image. Um, so, and uh, as you can see in this image also, that uh, um, our study have not been a theoretical study of historical sources only, but also a practical study, trying the methods in the garden. Huh? So you see, we, yeah, we see the old, uh, uh, sources and we look at the image sources and write uh, and read the, the written sources and then we try try it out and we try to follow the instructions as closely as we can in the garden to to uh, evaluate and some of the practices are well known we we still do it in the same way as as described in the written sources so here we see the smoothing loop uh, or in uh, in in the small historical image, uh, uh, we see a detail from the Encyclopédie by Diderot and D'Alembert, where we see the the rabot, um, the uh, a historical uh, version of this uh, tool that was uh, used a lot. So when we combined the written sources and the the image sources, we found and also the, our pr practical testing, uh, we developed uh, uh, a hypothesis, a hypothesis for a French-Swedish historical management regime. Um, so we found that the Swedish uh, maintenance of pathways uh, was very similar to the, to the French. And it consisted of, of uh, five steps. To start with, it was to remove leaves and debris with birch brooms or an iron rake from the pathway. The second step was to shovel the weeds in the gravel with a Dutch hoe, not everywhere, only where needed. And the third step was to collect the weeds with the rake. And uh, finally, to rake patterns in the gravel. No, sorry. Um, uh, the fourth step was uh, fine cleaning of, of the gravel with the broom. And the, the final step was to rake patterns in the gravel or sweep a smooth surface with a broom. And this regime is for sand or gravel pathways with loose material on top. Uh, and the sources for this uh, hypothesis or management regime was uh, um, Peter Lundberg, Johan Arlich, Desalier. Um, in Sweden, we really only know that they used the Dutch hoe and the rake. However, Peter Lundberg writes in his calendar about how nice it should look, which indicates um, the other steps uh, or tools as well. I have a problem with changing slides. So, um, and the other hypothesis for for uh, management regime was the English historical management regime. We saw uh, a clear difference between the French and the English descriptions, and uh, the English pathway uh, management regime for pathway was to sweep the pathway from debris with a broom. Um, and the second step was today when tested on rock floor, which is our uh, uh, top layer in, in the garden at Unibu. Uh, a smoothing loop was used to level the pathway. Um, and the third step was to roll the surface with a roller. Loose material in different fractions are pushed into the ground by the roller. This works best after rain. 
And the, uh, the goal is that the pathway should be even, compact, and easy to walk on. Usually only the roller is required. The sources for this management regime was London and Wise, uh, Mayville, Abercrombie, Philip Miller, and Desalier, to mention a few. It's a clear difference uh, if you have uh, a hard pathway or a soft pathway and the management connected to that. One is interesting possibility that uh, uh, Anna Andreasson already mentioned was uh, uh, to develop knowledge uh, by um, transdisciplinary collaboration between craft researchers or crop people or gardeners uh, with uh, to, together with uh, garden archaeologists. In this image, we see the garden archaeologist Karin Lindeblad investigating a pathway in a historical garden. A hypothesis that we have is that findings of pathways with hard surfaces, often with clay included, indicates historical maintenance with rollers. Uh, with the connection to the English um, management regime that I mentioned earlier. If the archaeological finding shows a soft, loose historical pathway, often consisting of sand, this indicates maintenance with rakes and Dutch hoes, um, also connected to the earlier mentioned management regime of, of sand or gravel uh, walks. So the material in the pathway is directly linked to the tools and the maintenance. Uh, and I also look forward to, to developing, to cooperating uh, more with garden archaeologists uh, um, to, to develop the knowledge in this field. In addition to sand and gravel, there were green walks, uh, which I mentioned earlier, made out of turf. Um, the materials accessible in different regions were not the same everywhere. The pathways came to represent the local nature and industry and, uh, and communicate local culture. So although gravel, sand and turf dominated, also other materials were sometimes recommended in the sources. Used tanner's bark, for instance, as top layer on pathway are recommended in Sweden by Åke Råland in the late uh, 17th century, and internationally by Johan Sigismund Eltsholz and John Claudius Lordon. Uh, Eltsholz uh, states that the used tanner's bark from oak is not only beautiful, but also prevents weeds through its high content of tannin, or in his words, Schärfe, um, pardon my German. And Laudon states that substitutes for gravel and sand are burned lumps of clay reduced to powder, pounded bricks, stones or slates, scoria, ashes, soapers, waste, coal, shells, sawdust, tanner's bark, ferruginous earth, and even moss or peat earth. Bark and peat earth are often used in Holland. Um, end of quotation. So um, a lot of different things were used uh, in the pathway as a top layer. And here are some, some examples from Sweden. We have a reconstruction of a rural road, uh, which is not really a pathway, but a rural road in the uh, Valby Open Air Museum in uh, Sweden. And we have seashells as a uh, top layer on the pathway at Sundsbysseteri on an island in Western Sweden, Schörn. Um, and we have some findings from Gunnebo House from the landscape garden. Uh, we see sand uh, from the 18th century pathway, uh, and the red layer on the spade is alum shale from the uh, 19th century pathway in the landscape garden. So two distinct 
different layers with different uh, aesthetical qualities. Um, and uh, alum shale is Arlen Schiffer in Swedish. In Sweden, there have also been a long tradition in making patterns with a rake in, uh, in gravel. Uh, and this, this tradition is still living, uh, especially at cemeteries. So, uh, if con concluding regarding the materials, uh, tools and pathway materials are connected. Soft surfaces are worked through with the tools and hard, sur hard surfaces are left undisturbed as much as possible in the historical practice. So in, in addition to the historical tests, we have also um, tested uh, uh, modern uh, equipment or methods. Um, and here the image at the top shows the pathway before treatment. The image in the middle shows the result right after treatment. And the images at the bottom shows the result one month after treatment. So, and uh, perhaps I should uh, translate this to Swedish. Uh, uh, white vinegar is ogras ethica. LP gas is uh, liquid petroleum gas. Gasol uh, and wheelhow is uh, julhacka. Um, so, um, and you see also uh, some, uh, we have measured the time efficiency for the different methods, and, and the wheelhow takes a lot of time. Uh, but you, you can also see the from the images here, you, you see it is clear that the manual tools that take a lot of time, but the result is lasting a longer time than the other two methods. With the white uh, vinegar and, and LP gas, you have to make the treatment often uh, to get a good result. And it works best if you also combine uh, white vinegar and LP gas. The large span in time difference between within the method is uh, due to the specific site conditions and the experience and skill of the practitioner as well. So this is uh, basically you have to choose uh, whether you you will do it. Uh, you will spend a long long time doing it properly with a wheel hoe. Uh, and, and get a result that is lasting, or if you want to do it often with the other methods. Uh, but then you really have to uh, go there and do it often. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of time, but you have to be there uh, very often. So now I will speak a little about uh, new demands. We have uh, many visitors wear and tear in our historic gardens and we also have the challenge with climate change mitigation adaptation and resilience to climate change um i included this uh, book cover in my presentation it's a wonderful book written uh, published in uh, uh, 2014 uh, about garden conservation and it shows a green walk um uh, as described in the uh, in in the 18th century by Desalier, so this is a, a pathway made out of a lawn, but uh, um, it didn't work in a public garden today. So it was changed from from a real lawn to a, an artificial lawn uh, in order to have the green walk in the public garden with a lot of lot of visitors to, today. So so that's one example. I don't think that we do that anymore because we know a lot more about uh, the, the problems with plastic in our gardens now. Uh, but this was uh, 10 or 15 years ago, um, an artificial uh, green walk in the garden in order to, to handle the, the large amounts of visitors in the public garden today. So climate change and pathways, there we have extreme weather with heavy rains 
that causes damage and much extra work and perhaps a need of modifying the garden to cope with this new challenge. In the image at the top, we see a modern way of trying to catch the water before the stairs. Uh, um, and in the image, image at the bottom left, we see a temporary solution for managing heavy rain. And in the image in the middle, we see water damages on a pathway uh, right below the stairs. And the image to the right shows the gutter for catching the water on both sides of a road and leading it away. These are all some, some historical examples uh, with the gutter, but also uh, new ways of more temporary or, or more, more permanent solutions to, to deal with this. So this is a large challenge. And um, um, it really causes uh, much extra work with uh, uh, especially the heavy rains uh, that destroys the pathways. It causes uh, much extra work for us in, in the historic gardens today. And a good way of dealing with this, we have started to try to do it, is to uh, before any, we, a storm is coming or we will have heavy rains, we, we, we do some preventive uh, temporary uh, measurements. We take some preventive me measurements in the garden to prevent large uh, damages. Uh, and it's basically to lead the water away from the hard surfaces into the soft, uh, soft green areas, uh, the lawns or the hedges. Uh, where where the water can be taken care of in an, in another way. So, but we are we are learning by doing, so to say, speak. Um, the legislation in Europe regarding use of chemicals for weed control have changed a lot in the last uh, few decades. So. And this, um, so many many chemicals are now banned, and this has triggered innovation of other methods for weed control. We have uh, thermic methods using heat, often uh, hot water or steam. We have uh, soft chemicals like white vinegar or ger geranium acid, uh, and. Uh, here, as we see in, in the image in, in the middle and to the uh, right, uh, it's the heat weed technology. Uh, it's a functioning technology for larger gardens, but the equipment, as you can see, uh, uh, it's, it's a rather large uh, uh, machine that you have to uh, have near to your garden. Uh, and also move around in the garden. So that's uh, uh, that uh, could be a problem if you have a lot of terraces or uh, different levels in the garden. Um, but that's one one way of uh, uh, working with heat. So in our study of pathway management, we have conducted some interviews as well. And the general answer is that after testing different methods like LP gas, so gasol in Swedish, white vinegar, heat weed, and so on, many gardeners turn back to manual methods for weed control. So um, this Actually, these methods work quite well compared to the new inventions. Um, and you get a good lasting result. So I just wanted to end my presentation with some, some, uh, uh, some thoughts about this theme. And that's uh, based on my study uh, of historical gardening and historic gardens. 
I would say that chemicals and power tools made our historic gardens what they are today. So what we see is the result of chemicals and power tools during the 20th century. One big problem is that we are used to perfect gardens. And this perfection has been created with chemicals and power tools in the 20th century. So perhaps we, we have to work on our norms and ideas about uh, how a garden should look. Perhaps some more weeds are authentic. And perhaps we need to change our ideas and norms about how our gardens should look. And it's, is it perhaps even possible to consider the pathway as a habitat for more than humans? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Joachim. This, uh, yeah, this raises a lot of questions and uh, and we are now getting into this uh, the panel, uh, first panel session, uh, where we will be answering questions from the audience. And uh, I think uh, maybe we should be uh, chronological about this and, and start with questions for Anna. So if uh, Joachim, if you'd like to maybe stop your sharing and Anna to switch on your video, uh, we can get into get into this um yep. as for uh, raising hands uh, if you want to to say something uh, i think it's better to just use the chat uh, or the q and a to write your question okay let's have a look at uh, so 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 anna you did answer some questions in the in the q and a there and i think all participants can actually go in and have a look at those answers so we don't need to read those out loud i believe they are visible uh, to to everybody so there are some nice uh, questions and answers already answered, but there is one from Jonathan there. I don't know if the, that's something that you would um, be able to answer. Have you found I, that? I realized I couldn't look at them and listen uh, at the same time, so I, I just I quit. <laughs> so yeah, you would, if you could tell me what it was. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, so Jonathan is ask, asking, have you found that walls were angled toward the garden or were they built vertically? Uh, so you mean like... Uh... I believe that's what he's asking, Jonathan. You can uh, you can clarify in the chat if you if you have uh, if you want to write anything more about that. But I think, uh, um, yeah. Well, uh, let's just. Uh, I haven't documented that many walls, but the, as I'd say, that depends on what kind of wall you have. Uh, in a haha, for example, you do have a little angle like that. Any retaining wall, I think, is a bit. Like, but I have no idea about the uh, degrees, angles, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, he means for, yeah, for, for the sake of stability, if you found that yeah. they, they used it. Uh, yeah. uh, but also, for example, in um, um, at, in Jön Köping there, we, we only found the bottom layer. The, all the rest was uh, taken away. So right. then that would be difficult to answer, of course. But um, um, yeah, I, I think the... Those are usually, I think you should probably document the like above ground documentation uh, of many of them would probably be a really a better idea, you know, to just go into this. Because when we do the archaeology and we have a um, romantic garden on top of the formal garden, then, well, often it's, it's removed. Yeah, right. Um, so another question here from Nicholas. Uh, have you found local sources of materials relating to the path archaeology, archaeology uh, whether within the property or the local area? That that's so, um, we are working like that now, you know, because these paths. I mean, they they are what they look like is very important part of what the garden looks like. It's not just a path. It's like the veins and arteries of the garden more or less. And it's also a skeleton keeping it together. And mm -hmm. if you change the surfaces a lot, then you change uh, a lot of the impression that the garden makes. So yeah. for example, the latest uh, example I showed you was Rosendahl. And there we, we, 
I think that was the first time we actually worked, you know, with a geologist who looked at this very carefully, all the different fractions, and 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 he, of course, he knew also the local, like Moran. I'm not even sure I, the, the soil. It's yeah. a, um, and uh, the 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 reason to do it is to go out and look for exactly the same. Yeah, where uh, it, where does it come from? What, yes, what, what and and in? can we find that that or something as similar as possible? Because I mean, I have seen many times, you know, for example, it makes a very it makes a big difference if you have a natural gravel that is locally sourced, and then you use maca like the crushed stone, yeah. for example. Then you change a lot. It, it it might seem like a small change, but but it is actually quite big, you know. Like, that, um, that's yeah. true and that, that moves me on to a question from me actually like uh, because there was a lot of sand in in mm -hmm. the, the, what yeah. you found and uh I, I just as as a person who's not an expert on this i feel like it's i know a lot of locations where you can actually just dig up sand uh, that's quite easy to find uh, in sweden at least in some parts anyway but i wouldn't i wouldn't know where to get gravel, like naturally occurring gravel to that extent, as I can find sand. So it would, would that be, I think, Same would, place, would, gra I think. would gravel, yeah, yeah. So they just sift you it. You just need to look for, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the geologists would know also. Right. But if you, I am pretty well, sure that if you find the sand, you will find the gravel also. These fractions. Yeah, because like, with, uh, with, uh, with how they it's been deposited, I guess, by yeah. from the Ice Age. But, exactly. but I, I just, feel, I, it feels like, um, Otherwise, feels like maybe gravel is something that's uh, more extensively used today mm. because it's easier to create and uh, and just also, just sifting yeah. as well is 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 a big big operation if you don't have electricity and machines and stuff. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting that the garden paths that uh, were all shaped with the sand and the silt. Yeah, you know? but the one uh, that were more for show in the in the parterre. Uh, of uh, Rosenlund, Rosendal, mm -hmm. uh, Rosenlund. Uh, there are roses everywhere. Yeah, um, um, yeah the Jönköping example. Uh, that was uh, just a, a much coarser, like gravelly uh, surface. And huh. well, we we can by discussing this, you know, from a practical point of view, perhaps that was so that you could actually shape patterns in it. Or okay, they, they there are. Um, we are still, this is very much a learning by doing as well. I mean, archaeology and especially garden archaeology is definitely learning by doing, mm -hmm. but uh, we've been doing it for, for a while now, you know, and uh, so we are starting to get like, the basics, but but we are still, I mean, and then also every garden is unique, especially yeah. because it's usually locally sourced materials and things like that. And uh, like the fossil soil example, um, they they do that uh, because of the slate, uh, like very rounded still, because it's probably from the river, like a deposition somewhere. But it's, it's so it's still rounded stones, but they are pitch black, and that kind that amount of pitch black stones would probably, I mean, that path would have been darkest gray or even black but then uh, in Kapur, for example they used white or yellowish white sand in the layers for example yeah. and that that might even be beach sand because uh, it's very close to to the ocean for example so there are all these kind of variables to consider yeah and and you would have to work with what you could get hold of so exactly. that would affect uh even if there, there was a best practice, you could not always practice that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, th I think the most important part is that you actually, you do sit down and you talk about these things and you and you make informed decisions. Because for, I've worked with one garden, for example, where they decided, well, we can't look for the local source, but we can use uh, natural gravel instead of crushed gravel. Yeah. And that changed, that, that part, that made a difference, you know, a big difference. And... Uh, uh, so, so you, you, uh, a middle ground was found, sort of, and it was also, you know, you you need to put it in writing, and you need to tell your, you know, the people that are coming in fifty years to take care of this garden why you'd made these decisions. It's the same thing, really. If any kind of restoration that you make, you need to think about 
the physical records as well, because mm -hmm. you know every time you dig, you mix up records, if you will. And uh, so the time to think about if there might be something you want to document and, and look into is right before you make your <laughs> reconstruction or your restoration of because course. you know and then you come in you've in 10 years because it is it does disappear when when you do it so uh, like for example at aids fall my whole job was to just document everything that would was removed during the the, the restoration process and i found these paths uh, like the remnants of the past of different EU areas and things. and we would not have had that information if if this wasn't done mm. and that was just me so still it was a cost it yeah. all had a enormous budget so that yeah. was you know different. yeah i was curious what what it is that makes you get to work with these different places but i don't think we have the time now uh, i'm no? going to ask okay. i'm going to yeah. put some questions Sorry. in the q a and and the yeah. rest of you can uh, i'm as just well. talking <laughs> and, and and anna can can fill in and answer the q a questions during the day so you, they will be available you can have a look at them yeah um but uh, so i'm just going to move on to 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 uh you Joachim here and daniel but I also want to point out that uh, we're, we're using polls today, um, and there are uh, three questions, I think, uh, in, in a poll, and it's available in the chat. So, uh, and this uh, relates to like how you um, uh, work with your pathways uh, currently. And it would be really interesting to see uh, some results coming in there. So feel free to just click that and, and, uh, and put some answers in. Uh, but also, so a uh, question for you, Joachim here from the Q&A. Um, yeah. There was this uh, mention of this uh, manual for gravel path uh, maintenance. Uh, it's in Swedish. Do you have plans to translate it, Daniel? You wanted to to answer uh, that. Would you like to do that, Daniel? But it's a, it looks like Joachim is on Daniel's account right now, and he's frozen. So we'll see about that answer later. Uh, we put the link to the manual in the, in the chat and in the Q&A. Uh, looks like uh, the Gunnebo people are a little bit frozen right now. So maybe they will return. But then I would like to, maybe we should have a look at the poll uh, instead. Yeah, Mercy, feel free to show the show the QR code and get more people to answer the poll while we wait for Joachim to sort out his computer. Here's Mercy, she's managing the polls. Fantastic, so I'll just share my screen with you. So yeah. if you have a look, there is a QR code which you can scan on your mobile and that will take you to the first poll. If you are don't have a mobile, uh, you can use the link in the chat and that will take you directly there if you have a go at those for five minutes or so you can see it's updating live which is quite fun then i will share the next question at about um 25 past 10 once you've had a look at this great okay thank you yeah so i mean having i mean doing an archaeological survey uh, obviously i think would be a dream for most uh, gardeners in historic gardens just to get to get um, a, a look on what what we've got uh, and i think i mean Anna, would you say that the the most common things you find is is the the pathway and walls and parterres or is is there something else that's like commonly found that can shed light on things we are we, we are learning you know bit, uh, bit by bit and and uh, for example lately i've been working a lot with lawns because uh -huh. uh, like all the between spaces that we, we are we are quite good at finding you know the lines like the, the paths and the walls and and the and the, also the flower beds you know, are right. but um for because example, they would have a different organic uh, yeah different kinds of organic contents and yeah. what how it was maintained but i also wanted to say that i mean if you don't have the money to have an archaeologist come in you can do quite a lot yourself you know because you 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 the the if you document your work, uh, what you see, what you find, then at least you have you you have that. Uh, and then, if you want, you can discuss with an archaeologist as a late point. You can yeah. have a a look like a discussion going for your garden and like continuous discussion about the different parts. And uh, because it's going to be continuous, you yeah. you always learn new things. Yeah. 
Kate, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, one of the things that came up, you were talking about the GPR techniques. Mm. And just to explain, we use the term geophys is is the current term. Um, But also, if you can't afford that, of course, there's good old fashioned parch marks. Uh, yes. which we with climate change we're seeing more and more during the dry spells oh. um so and and combined with drone technology um if you're up there with a drone taking photographs of your gardens do look out for the parch marks mm. where the paths are often shown in, in sort of ghostly form <laughs> yeah and that means so, so you get a yellowing usually in That's a green right. space yes. uh, because it's drier there here here we got our swedes <laughs> Uh, maybe, Mercy, maybe we should just uh, look at the next poll question before we uh, put some answers to the to Daniel and Joachim. Absolutely. Um, I think you've got a brief glimpse of my cat there. Yeah. So I will share my screen. He always, always pops up uh, during Zoom. Do so let's do that and start the next one. There we go. How do you keep your paths read free? Again, you can scan the QR code with your mobile or I will drop the link into the chat in a moment. And this is a word cloud. So just pop down um, the words that come to mind and the biggest ones will and the most popular ones will show largest. So we're getting people with my favorite hand tools. I will stop sharing and I'll pop the link in the chat and we'll have a look at it in a minute. Yeah. And if we have more panel sessions, so we can also have a look at the end of the, of the webinar. So it's not the we'll see how much time we have for this break. But the, so uh, Daniel and uh, you, Akim, about the translating the, the uh, manual there. Uh, what do you have to say? Yeah. Uh, when preparing for this webinar, um, I, I uh, found a lot of material that we haven't published. So uh, so I was uh, um well we have not uh, planned to translate that publication but uh, uh we have done a study we have studied this topic quite a lot both daniel and i and and i think we we have to find we have to search for a solution a, a po- possibility to to uh, publish something because we have uh, done uh, quite some work on this uh, so, but uh, there are no specific plans at the moment for this. Okay, but uh, there will be a workshop about uh, pathways and stone walls, and uh, in this in this project. So, at least if you want to learn in English, uh, you can attend the workshop in the summer. Um, yeah, and, and so uh, Chris asks um, a good point about paths not having been perfect, but how do you manage the public's response to seeing weeds uh, in paths? Well, um, actually, we have had comments on uh, being too too uh, tough on the weeds by the visitors to Gunnebo, but it's perhaps they are. It's a sustainable bunch that that are coming here. Uh, they 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 really push us even pr- further in this uh, direction. So, um, but of course, I think. Um, uh, the thing that we we deal with here is to to uh, once you are doing something uh, alternative that looks different from the, the the normal or the usual, you have to give an explanation why why does it look differently? Uh, why are we doing this? And often people accept it when they once they get an explanation that it's uh, there's a th- uh, thought behind this is intentional and it's for the sake of biodiversity or uh, to um, adaptation to climate change if you have a good um, argumentation people usually accept it but if you don't say why you're making changes then people get angry that's true um now how do you tackle this um this issue of uh, resources when it's we're talking natural 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 gravel uh do you, are, are you looking at alternatives to natural gravel or um or at, are you re- are you recycling like uh, how, at, how are you at uh, at Gunnebo, um we 
uh, the the traditional material was not uh, natural gravel. It was uh, crushed material from on site. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, from on site and nearby. So so it was lucky uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. But uh, and it's it's like. Uh, it's like with the emissions of uh, of carbon dioxide. What you, you see, you can always say that uh, there is China, and they are they were much worse than us. So there's there's always another one taking more of the natural resources, and and for uh, uh, when it comes to natural gravel, it's uh, it's. Um, the cement industry, uh, I think, that uh, needs uh, a lot of that uh, those natural resources. Um, so historic gardens could maybe, in some cases, I think we should we should um, uh, differentiate this to have some examples with the real deal, with the real uh, um, going all the way with historic materials. But we cannot do that in all historic gardens because then we, we need uh, uh, too much of the natural resources. So we have to find different ways. Um, and also when it comes to recycling, we've, we've just been discussing that, not, uh, not testing it, but that's uh, uh, and a, a very interesting idea for the future to try to recycle the material because uh, buying and transporting uh, materials uh, far and wide is not uh, sustainable. Um, hmm. Right. Um, it is time for the break, but it just uh, there were two people asking about the, the wheel uh, machine, uh, I mean, the tool. Is, is that the Swedish one by um, Lucko? Is 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 it uh, the Swedish one with the one? Yeah. That you. Yeah, that's the one. The wheel the, hoe. Yeah. The wheel hoe. Yes. Okay. So then I put uh, I put a link. Uh, I'll put a link to it um, in the chat. Uh, Mercy wants to do one more slide, so let's do. Let's let her do that. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And I think I saw one more cat as well. Yes, there are two <laughs> occurring in my home. <laughs> it's always nice to see another yeah. cat. <laughs> so that's that one, and I will show you them later. Yeah, I think so we, maybe we can get the results at the end, actually. Yeah. It might be a good idea. We'll see, yeah. unless we have a little extra time somewhere. But uh, And what I did with the last one was I did a quick PDF of them and shared it in the chat right at the end of the day so that people could look if they if they wanted to. So this is apart from weed control, what maintenance techniques do you use on your paths? And I will share the link in the chat. I think this, the poll questions will be very useful to see, to get inspiration from, from your colleagues around Europe, uh, find new ways of doing things. And uh, on that note, I think we have to stop with the questions, but uh, I will ask this, all of you who are in the panel uh, to have a look in the chat and in the Q&A, and if there's anything you can answer, just feel free to do that, and then uh, people can read the answers. And uh, and if there's anything there's time to bring up later, I, I will do that. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, obviously, on this topic. But uh, we're going to do a short break now uh, until quarter two, when it'll be time for.